Um, I am, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Carolyn Smith and I work with the WMU Alumni Association. So um, before we really get going, I think most of you have done lots of Zoom calls, but um, just a couple housekeeping things. So I already told you we're going to record this, so we'll hopefully make it available. There were a few people who said they were going to try to jump on, so you'll probably see people kind of coming and going. Um, and we will let you guys talk some more a little bit at the end here, but for now, if you don't mind, I see most of you have already gone ahead and put yourselves on mute. We'll let uh, Dr. Gambino be the star here. Um, and finally, we of course mean for this to be a little bit informal, so feel free. I know some of you are probably working from home or back in the office at this point, um, but feel free to enjoy your lunch um, and feel free to, to um, Put any comments or questions in the chat and we can go cover those a little bit later but we'll also let you talk a little bit too so um let's see what else would i tell you well let's just get started then so i guess first of all we kind of started this because a few months ago the alumni association sent out a survey and we wanted to come up with a plan to improve the alumni experience for all of our Broncos. So part of that survey was an open-ended question reflecting on an individual who maybe made a special impact on a student's experience while they were at Western. And I think that you probably can all guess um, based on the interest level here, that one of those names came up more than many others. So we have Dr. Gambino joining us today. Thank you for that. And I think most of you are familiar with him, but for those of you who need a refresher, he is the director of the marketing, the food and consumer packaged goods uh, marketing program at Western. And I know most of you know that that is ranked very highly in the country. Um, in addition to teaching, he serves as the faculty advisor to the Food Marketing Association and oversees the Food Marketing Conference, which he grew from 60 attendees to 800 attendees. We'll hear about that too. Um, and I know Dr. Gambino, you really have created a program that kind of feels like a family, which is obvious from knowing all of these faces here. Um, I also know that you like to incorporate fun and games into your learning. So I think it's obvious that um, Students and alumni really appreciate and benefit from your commitment and they're excited to see you and I know you have a genuine desire to really see them succeed. I was telling uh, Dr. Gambino when we talked earlier this week that I was reading as I researched some student reviews and one said, among many other compliments, one said he's a very famous guy. So we are excited for you to join us. And <laughs> I will uh, stop talking now because really we're here to hear from you. So um, if you wouldn't mind starting with kind of updates on Western and that kind of thing, and we all know that the pandemic really has had an impact on all of us. Um, can you tell us just to start how it's impacted Western and the food marketing program? Um, as I look Start around, there. I know I have at least two uh, recent alums on here and probably lived through the early stages of the pandemic. But, you know, uh, the pandemic has really had a significant impact on the university, as well as all universities across the United States. It's, uh, it, it's kind of sad to see uh, what's transpiring. You know, I think if you were on campus right now, it would feel eerie, like you're almost on a, in a ghost town. You know, all the buildings are, for the most, most matter, they're, they're mothballed. You know, there's nobody allowed access into any of the buildings right now. And so, you know, the campus isn't what it looks like normally at this time of the year. It's usually a very vibrant looking campus. And um, so it's kind of uh, sad. Um, you know, I think uh, from the financial impact, it's been pretty significant, you know, and when we look at our losses just from the spring semester, we, we lost $45 million just due to needing to close the campus down. And, you know, projections are for this coming year, we're going to lose another 45 
in a best case scenario and uh, up to 85 million in a worst case scenario. And, and I think right now we're planning for a worst case scenario because this pandemic does not look like it's going away too soon. And I think it has some real serious impacts. You know, when you, you think of a campus environment, you know, a lot of our revenue streams come from the students, their tuition, their spending. You know, we, we have empty student housing. So we have no revenue coming in from student housing. We have empty dining centers. We have empty conference centers. We have Miller Auditorium basically mothballed. And, you know, so all of these are revenue streams. Uh, parking service, you guys probably be thrilled to know that parking tickets are not being issued right now. Uh, that's always been a big bugaboo with students, but you know, right now you could probably park anywhere on campus and not worry about getting a parking ticket. But you know, but that revenue stream has uh, kind of disappeared on us as well. So, um, you know, we look at enrollments and we're trying to project what the fall looks like from an enrollment standpoint. And you know, I think a lot of students want to be back in that in-person experience. They you know, they all think they're made of steel and, you know, this virus is not going to affect them. Uh, I think their parents probably feel a little bit different. And so I think we're seeing, you know, parents may be a little more reluctant as, you know, and, and I think all of us are affected by that. I mean, we're seeing it with the elementary school kids, the, you know, the uh, high school kids. And university is not much different, except that we're dealing with adults. and they can make their own decisions. But for a lot of parents, they're somewhat leery of sending their kids back into an environment where the virus is still quite active. Um, and as we, we look at some student surveys, you know, I think a significant number of students are thinking of taking a gap year and letting this thing run out before they come back. So this next year is gonna be extremely challenging to Western and all universities across the United States. Uh, we're going through some very, very painful um, staff and faculty cuts. I mean, to the tune of 20, 25%, which is enormous when you think about one out of four people losing their jobs. Um, I think we all believe we're gonna come out of this stronger and that we'll be a vibrant university, maybe a smaller university, uh, due to a lot of reasons. I think, you know, if we look at the demographics, we have uh, fewer graduating seniors going on to college. And so you've got a demographic that's kind of working against you on top of everything else we're looking at uh, affecting us by the pandemic um, that are gonna impact enrollments. and. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, on a nutshell, uh, some of the, the impacts on the university as a whole. I mean, and I'd tell you right now, all of us would tell you, if you asked us, you know, what's it look like going forward? You know, I think it's as clear as mud right now. I mean, and I think it's like that for the whole country. I, I, we're all trying to figure out when is this gonna be over and when can we get back to some semblance of order? or normalcy, uh, and we're not any different being a university, but. I know you all, of course, had to switch over to virtual. Is, how did that go for you and for the students? Uh, you guys had to do it within a day, really, just a quick switch. I, I would tell you, I think we're all zoomed out. <laughs> I think we've all had our, our fair share of Zoom. And um, you, you know, when you think about it, I mean, we had to flip a switch almost overnight where both faculty and staff, or students, I mean, we went from a in-person learning experience to almost overnight having exclusively all instructions being online. And that was a challenge for students, and it was a monumental challenge for faculty to be able to deliver online when they weren't set up to do that. You know, I mean, some were, but for the most part, I, I would tell you that uh, most were not ready for that. Yeah. So I, I take my hat off to the faculty because I, I think the faculty did a spectacular job 
they really had about a week to really get up to speed on how they can deliver their material the most effective way. And, and then just changing everything as the rest of the semester progressed. Right. And, and I, I think know. from a standpoint, you know, it was really tough. I mean, the students that I've talked to, to have to sit in front of, you know, a lot of students have full days, you know, they're on campus, you know, from morning to, uh, you know, early evening sometimes. And to have to sit in front of a computer for eight hours looking at instructions um, and, and lectures, I think we'd all agree that's a long time to sit in front of a computer. And uh, so it's been challenging on everybody's side. Yeah. And I know you had to cancel the food marketing conference too, but you shared some things with me the other day that I thought these, these folks might be interested in hearing. Yeah, I mean, that was the most painful thing I've had to do uh, in my years at the university uh, was to cancel the food marketing conference, which uh, for my, my students know that that's one of our major fundraisers for the, it is our major fundraiser for the year. And it provides us the ability to provide scholarships and experiential learning opportunities and just program operations, student travel, and so forth. And we actually made the decision before there was even case number one of COVID in Michigan. And it was an extremely difficult decision to make, but we were looking at the national situation of what was going on. And, you know, when we told the DeVos Place and Amway Grand that we were gonna cancel, they didn't want to let us off the hook of our contract. They just basically said, what are you talking about? We're like four weeks away from your conference. Uh, and there isn't a case of COVID in the entire state of Michigan. And, you know, things just rapidly change. I mean, within a week or two, we all sat back and said, boy, it looked like we had a crystal ball. Because, you know, within a week or two, just about the entire country was shutting down all business travel and all conferences were closing down. And so that was very, very painful. Um, I would tell you the, the positive, and I think that's what you were referring to, Carolyn, was, you know, we, we've all been in an experience where we, we get a phone call on our phones and we don't recognize the phone number. And we're kind of like, mm, I'm just gonna let that go into voicemail or I'm not gonna answer it. And, I don't know why, but for some reason I decided to answer this call. And, uh, and I answered the phone and uh, the gentleman on the other line said, this is Peter Whitsitt um, from Meyer, who I, I knew who Peter was. He's the uh, executive VP of Meyer. And Peter said to me, uh, and he almost had me in tears and I, I was, totally choked up over the whole experience, you know, but he said, you know, the entire Meyer family, as well as the entire Meyer executive team, does not want to see the students hurt by the fact that you had to cancel the conference this year. And so he said, we want you to keep all the money that we would normally spend on the conference, our sponsorship, our table registrations, we want you to keep all that money and, and put it towards the students. And, and that had a ripple effect. Uh, we had 60 corporate sponsors and 55 of them followed suit and said, we wanna support the students, we want you to keep the money. And, uh, you know, and I gotta tell you, that was just such an impactful thing for me personally uh, to have that kind of support from the industry and, and that they saw the greater importance of this conference. And, it, and because of that, we're going to give $100,000 in scholarships away this fall that we would not have been in a position to do uh, without that kind of support. So uh, extremely thrilled that uh, we had that kind of support. Yeah, that's I awesome. Say that we're, we're we're, we're back trying to plan for next year's conference. And, you know, virtually all of our speakers from last year said, we're on board, keep us. We want to stay on the program. And we had like 40 speakers. And I think 
we, we had a couple that said, I can't foresee what next year is going to bring. But for the most part, I think we had about 36 out of the 40 speakers that said, hey, pencil us in, we're on board for next year. And so now we're looking at the conference and we're saying, can we even have a conference in March? And I, I don't think we would have ever envisioned we'd be looking a year down the road and still questioning whether or not we could have a conference. And so now we're looking at how can we have a first class virtual experience for a conference possibly in 21 and maybe trying to have a big bash in 22 uh, with an in-person event because I guess my gut tells me we're not going to be out of the woods early spring of next year, you know, March at least. I don't know whether we'll be out of the woods. Well, I would guess if you go virtual, it will probably be the best virtual conference there ever was. <laughs> we're hoping, we're hoping. <laughs> Can you tell us, because I know that you, you know, are so still so closely connected with the industry and that is likely why they wanted you to keep the sponsorship that they um, so generously gave. Tell us how you think this has changed the industry and what the long-term impacts are for them. Wow. I mean, if, if, if any of us could have foreseen this, it would have been, un, you know, it had been great to have a crystal ball. I mean, if we look at almost overnight, food retailers and manufacturers had to deal with surges in sales of 40 to 70% almost overnight. Uh, they weren't ready for it. Yeah. The retailers weren't ready for it. The manufacturers weren't ready for it. And I'm sure for many of you that were shopping, you probably saw that in the shelves. You know, they were empty. But how do you, how do you ramp up 70% volume increases over uh, I was listening to the Clorox and everybody's trying to find Clorox wipes mm -hmm. and the, the Clorox CEO was talking that their sales were up 400% and they didn't have the capacity. They were running at full capacity and they virtually could not keep up with the demand for their product right now. And I think they could ramp up 40% increase in their uh, their manufacturing but could not keep up with the 400 percent demand I, and i think we all saw that everybody was looking for clorox wipes and they're still kind of hard to find sometimes they are hard to find so but i think long term i think you know the the other thing that happened where manufacturers basically said we got to put all our efforts into fast selling goods. And so a lot of items that were on the shelf that were slower movers, you found manufacturers just pulling production on those items and saying, we got to put all our efforts into the, the workhorses, those items that the customers most want. And so I think long-term, I, I think some of those slow moving items may disappear. You know, I think you might see a reduction in some of the SKUs. I think from a retail standpoint, they have a golden opportunity to really enhance the consumer experience. And all of us, you know, maybe have a band, you know, before all this, maybe our kitchens weren't quite as familiar to us as they are today. You know, I mean, many of us were eating breakfast on the run and lunch somewhere out at a restaurant or and, and dinner sometimes, depending on kids' schedules, you know, were hit and miss. And, and now, you know, I'm hearing everybody's making three meals a day, you know, and, and so we've seen retailers, you know, their sales still today are up 17 to 23%. So, you know, they got a great opportunity to capture customers with the type of experience that they're having. And, hopefully kept, keep some of that when uh, things eventually get back to normal. Um, I had another thought there and it just escaped me. So I'll, <laughs> I may come back to it. It'll come back, I'm It'll sure. Back. <laughs> well, on that note, we'll, let's, let's talk about memories for a minute because one of the reasons we wanted to 
get you on here was so that we could give alumni a chance to kind of reconnect and maybe even share some of their own memories. So can you start by telling us how you ended up at Western and then maybe any funny or memorable stories you have from like your first year, couple years at Western? Well, I always talk about the importance of networking. So I will tell you, and you know, for those of you that are new graduates, uh, along with us older or more seasoned veterans, you know, we have gone through a lot of these economic downturns. And so uh, I was working for a major food retailer out of Detroit, uh, going back to 1969. Uh, but in the mid 80s, we were going through an economic downturn and the company made it known that they were going to sell the company. And I was in corporate merchandising at the time. And uh, so, you know, you start looking around, what are my next options? You know, and I was looking across the country and, and I would tell you that people were probably less receptive to relocation out of state back in the 80s than they are today. I think students today kind of expect relocations kind of a, a thing that you need to consider. But I was uh, attending a industry conference and I ran into my college professor from Western and uh, my predecessor in the program actually. And he said to me, he says, I'm getting ready to retire and I think you should put your name in for my job. And I, honest to God, I said this. <laughs> I I laughed at him, and and I mean I I love the guy, you know. And I and I said, you know, I don't know if I can slow my my daily pace down enough to be a college professor. Now we all have those images, and you know, I that has bit me more. And, and my students that know me know that I don't sit on my hands and. But you know, there was a perception, and probably in some parts of the world, it probably still is today, that you know, oh, you, you teach two days and you golf the other three days, you know? And, and I was hearing that from my colleagues at the retail firm I was with. They said, well, you're gonna teach two days, and what do you do the rest of the time, you know? So my wife would tell you that uh, I've eaten those words many times because I think I work far many hours today. My, my typical school year schedule is five in the morning till seven, 7.30 at night on many nights, not all nights, but, uh, but typically up at five. And, and so, yeah, I've ate those words many times, but I, have enjoyed uh, the opportunity. You know, I often said to people early on in my career, when I was working for one firm, you have 100% dedication to the company you're working for. And, and when you come to an environment such as this, I had an opportunity to work across the entire industry with CEOs and executives from multiple manufacturing companies and retailers and so it's been a very rewarding career and um, being able to see my students succeed in the industry as they've uh, grown into young adults. I, I sometimes say I don't recognize the new person who wasn't in sweats with a baseball cap on uh, when they were in class and now all of a sudden they're dressed up as young professionals. And, um, but it's nice to see that growth and to see their success. You want funny stories. Do you have any funny stories? Funny memories? Bizarre uh, memories? Well, you know, I, <laughs> so I'm walking away from my 15 year career in retail and I am on campus and I've been through grad school and I'm used to this gigantic, you know, this exchange of uh, dialogue with my students or, you know, my graduate students that I was in. And at that time, we taught freshmen through seniors, and now we're teaching just upperclassmen, but, or at least myself. And I walked into this freshman level class, and I don't know if they were more scared or I was, but it was like walking into a morgue, nobody talked. And I, so between classes, I called my wife and I said, I think I made the world's worst career decision. 
And she says, you just got to hang with it. So then I went into one of my senior level classes and they reassured me why I wanted to get into education because the seniors were not shy and scared to be there. They were active and engaged in the classroom. And so that made it a lot of fun. But I got to tell the students, we didn't have PowerPoint back then. Everything was on overhead projectors where you had to had the little acetates and you put whatever you were going to put up on the screen on that acetate and uh, mimeograph machines were still around back in the early 80s and uh, we actually wore ties and suits to class every day and I think most of us got rid of those except for on special occasions. And, but probably one of my favorite alumni stories from my early years was I had an alumnus who was an executive for a food wholesaler who was coming back to campus to speak at one of our um, food, we called them food forums uh, back then. And they were held every Wednesday and at four o'clock and we would have an executive come in and talk to the students about their company or their career path and whatever. And I knew this guy really well, and he shows up at my office at nine o'clock in the morning, and I'm looking at him, I said, Jay, it's not till four o'clock. I said, we got the whole day. And he says, oh, I, I've got lots of stuff I can find to do. And so across the street from the Trump building where we taught was the Nowood Tavern. And the students would always go to the Nowood Tavern before the food forum, come back kind of juiced up sometimes. And, uh, but I get a call from our student leader, the president of our business fraternity at the time. And he says, Dr. Gambino, I'm over at the Nowood Tavern and our food forum speaker is over here. And I don't think he's in any shape to speak. And I'm going, oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. And so I tell our administrative assistant, uh, put some signs up through the building that the session's been canceled. And I go across the street to the Nowood Tavern. And here is Jay with all these students holding court. And he wasn't drunk at all, but he was having the time of his life. And I walk over and he says, lighten up Gambino, we're just having some fun on you. Uh, I go, yeah, we just canceled your speaking event. <laughs> and, I mean, if, you know how it is, you tell students, it's like wildfire. The minute you say something's canceled, boom, they're gone, you know? And so his uh, speaking activity ended that day. <laughs> You're on mute. Oh, I love that. Love it. I and that I think makes the next question come up for me because I'm going to skip a few. But I just so all of you alumni know, we're going to ask you to be the seniors in the class who are not shy, and we'll let you guys talk in just a couple minutes. But before I do that, I, it just even from that story, Dr. Gambino, it really seems that you created a program that feels kind of like a family. So how do you feel like that plays a role in the success of Western's program? Because I think it probably does. Well, you know, first, I think we got some really dedicated faculty. I mean, they're, they're dedicated to making the student experience a great one. And, and so that rubs off. And I think the students in our program become our ambassadors while they're students. And, you know, our program, grows only because of word of mouth. You know, most students don't go to Western or any campus thinking they're gonna major in food and consumer package goods. Unless they came out of the business from a family business, most of them are recruited uh, from our student population when they're on campus. So I think the experience the students get, uh, they become our ambassadors while they're on campus. And then I think when they graduate, uh, they become champions of the program uh, as alumnus. And they, they work real hard with their, their companies to stay engaged with us and to support us. A lot of them that are on the screen, I know, have come back and participated 
in our classrooms after they've graduated. And so, you know, they're, they're our best advocates and ambassadors is, uh, and I think a lot of it is because of the experience that they get on campus. And I should mention before I forget, because um, our, our student team this year, before COVID took over the world, back in February, took the national case competition and we were crowned the national champs. And so we're really excited about that. Yeah. We, you know, we have had this ongoing battle with St. Joe's University, which we've always been considered number one and number two, you know, and if you talk to them, they say they're number one and talk to us, we say, no, no, you're not number one, we're number one. And so we've been competing with them for a lot of years and probably the last five years, maybe six, uh, Western Michigan and the St. Joe's food program have been in the finals every year for the last six years. Wow. And uh, so it's like, boy, when you got that, we're the champs this year, buds. <laughs> uh, we, we get to gloat for at least one year. And uh, so it's, it's kind of fun. That's awesome. So what else is new is happening with the program? Wow, we got so much going on, Carolyn. I don't know where you want me to start. Um, well, so for the alumni uh, in the food program, you know, one of the things we started, and uh, some of you I know work for a Hormel. Where's my Hormel folks? Nicole and Molly. Okay. And Justin. That's right. Okay. Uh, Bob Samples. Uh, is an executive on, in residence, and he joined us after a very distinguished career as an executive with Hormel. And Bob is heading up our executive in resident or our executive education program called our Emerging Leaders Program. And so we're just really excited to have Bob. He's been with us now five years, I think it is. It time flies really quickly. But Bob's heading that up, and we also have a food industry research and education center, which the executive education program is going to be part of that. And uh, Dr. Uh, Zondak, uh, Marcel Zondak, is going to be the director of that center. And then uh, we've got plans for a innovation center, which is, is going to engage a lot of data analytics and uh, technology. And Dr. Vec is uh, heading up that uh, project for us. And then we've been uh, we've been engaged with, and a lot of this is a little bit of it has been put on hold because of COVID. But we've been working with uh, Ipsos, uh, a marketing research firm, and they happen to be the current owners of a global packaging archive that. Um, has something like 60,000 consumer package goods packages. So it's, it's a library of packaging, more or less. And uh, they want to donate that to Western Michigan. And so we're trying to build a center that can house that uh, archives. Uh, we also are talking with a firm that I can't mention yet, but they've committed to bring virtual reality uh, to Western's campus for space planning and store design, which uh, we're hoping once we get back to some semblance of order, we're gonna we're gonna have that available uh, the, to the students coming in. Um, we also have a brand new faculty member who we have been courting for probably I've been courting him for about three years, but. He's, he's the guy that I, I said is the number one free agent on the market. And uh, we're so excited that we were able to sway him our way because I knew St. Joseph's was also trying to get him to go to their school and we didn't want that to happen. So uh, Dr. Russell Zwanka is gonna be joining us uh, in a few weeks. He's gonna be moving here, uh, actually he's moving this week uh, to Kalamazoo. And we're just really excited about his uh, presence. He was a uh, industry executive in the food business. Uh, he was a executive vice president in merchandising and marketing. And trust me, he, and, and he had one of these turns in his career where he just decided, 
he was gonna, much like Dr. Zondok, for those of you that know Dr. Zondok, you know, somewhere in his life just said, I'm, I, I gotta get off this roller coaster I'm on and I wanna do something different. And Dr. Zwenka started teaching adjunct while he was still in the industry and said, gosh, I really love being around students. And he liked the whole environment and went and pursued his PhD. And he's going to be a Bronco here shortly. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, so those are the big things. I don't think I've missed anything except that we were working with a developer to build a food center to house all these elements. And, you know, Western has had to put everything on ice as far as construction until we get through the pandemic and can figure out where we're going to be. So, you know, we had been working with a developer that uh, wanted to build a facility for us. Um, I'm hoping I see it before I formally retire. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of new stuff, and I we're getting close to the end, but I do want to give everyone a chance, and and I have more questions for you. So if nobody wants to talk, we won't force you to. But if any of you alumni have questions or memories you want to share, um, favorite class, favorite program, anything you want to share, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and jump in. I think, was it Brian who, did I see that? Brian Kaczynski? I don't know if that was it. You got a memory. Carolyn, as Chris, as Chris Burns, I unmuted myself. I'll go first. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, well, we're the, we're the old timers, Frank. I mean, see, so for the students back then, we, we called you Frank. You didn't have your PhD back then. We called you Frank back then. But I, I'm, sure. I'm, so, I'm so glad that you brought up the food forums and the Knollwood because that's exactly my memory. And Because we got most of our business was done at Knollwood Tavern, even if we were younger than 21. And so there was a lot of good times. I remember that story very well that you spoke of. Um, and so that's a true story, but you know, the, the, you, you talked about the uniqueness of our program back then we had about a hundred people in the food program and, and because people were off doing internships and that's the best thing that I had. And I came from a family business. I came into the food business back then, probably 80 to 90% of the people were retail oriented and then 10% were wholesalers, uh, distributors. They went into focus or, or when, you know, very few people went into data, but you know, today it's totally different. But the best thing about the program, it was so small and unique. It, it was a family and it was, it was a lot of fun. And so what I, I used to tell people and I tell people, young people today, get into a program and I, and I've got another hormone and, and Frank knows my goddaughter who's, who's not on here today. I helped introduce her to the program and, and to Dr. Gambino and she's worked for Hormel as well. But I said, you got to get in the program and, 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 and find a program in college that you can be an intern. You can do internships because it, is, it, it will help you leaps and bounds during college and out of college to get a foot up on everything. And so all of you and many of you, I'm assuming, did the same thing. But the, that internship and that smallness played, paid huge dividends in my career. I've been with the government for 34, 35 years now, and it's been, it's been, a, great, it's been a great career, and it started – you know, at Western, what I learned. So a lot of great memories, the other great memories, and we can't tell all the stories, but the bus trips, when you went out to the, in the field and, and those summer bus trips, there was a lot of partying and a lot of, a lot of, a um, lot of things. Yes. A lot of things that were on that bus that shouldn't have been on the bus, but we had a lot of fun. So uh, enjoyed it immensely. Dr. Gambino was such a great sports because we ribbed him so much because we were close in age with Dr. Gambino. But he's always been generous. It's been great keeping in touch with him over the years, you know, 30 years. So God bless you, Frank. Good to see you. Chris, thank you. And I got I will remember one thing from that bus trip of yours. <laughs> yes, even though it's been 30-some years. They, I went out the first year with Dick Message, and we went out together. And at the end of the trip, they gave Dick Nessage a bottle of Jack Daniels, and they gave me a bottle of grape juice. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. uh, I, I 
feel like I heard some of the, I had a roommate who was food marketing. I'll have to ask you later if you knew her, but I, I recall some bus trip stories. So <laughs> anyone else? Uh, we, hey, I'll go next. Uh, I, we, we could do a whole nother like three hour session on just bus trip stories alone. So uh, I look forward to that one coming out. Uh, but no, I mean, you know, I completely piggybacking, but in the same thread, as I reflect on like, you know, I graduated in 2007 and the industry is not the same as it was then. And it wasn't the same as it was when you started and it will always be evolving and changing. And it's interesting because when this came out, I, I've kept, I kept everything that I, you know, had from the classroom, from textbooks to notebooks and everything. And I re I was reflecting back on that uh, last week and I said, I don't remember anything that I was taught. But what I do remember and what has carried on with me for the past 13 years and will for the rest of my professional and personal life is the fact that like, it's that family. It's why do, why do we do things like this today on July 15th, 13 years after I graduated, come back. It's because of that sense of community, how to have fun while also working like a, a freaking workhorse. Um, you know, it's, you know, the students are always going to come and go, but Dr. Gambino has never changed. Um, you know, I've connected with so many alumni over the years that are, whether it's through my internship or just through other forums, where it's like, oh, you went to Western? It's like that light bulb goes off because right away it's like, let's tell our best stories and a half hour later or however long you've circled back to those memories and it's it's there's a lot of fun memories that probably can't be shared on a recorded message but it always circles back to like that meaningful piece was how we how every individual student was individually impacted by your teachings your learnings but more importantly how you made us feel walking off campus like we were ready to face anything in life so thank you for all of those memories you've given me and uh, I, I know there's thousands and countless of others that uh, share that same sentiment. I, I told my team I want to retire on the tails of COVID, so I may have to stick around. <laughs> well, I, I think that is a good segue because I, I think I could keep asking you questions all day. And I know Dr. Gambino has said he'll stick around a little bit longer if anyone wants to do a, an informal chat, at which point I will stop recording. Um, but I do wanna give you a chance for some final thoughts. And I, uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, just because our newest graduates are walking into such a strange, crazy environment, what advice, you gave them as they graduated this year? Uh, well, my final class was taught, and I think the whole um, You know, one of the things I, I said how important I, I really feel, and I think it's important for anybody, regardless what, where you're at in your career, is to really maintain your network of individuals. You know, so if you can, if you're still a student or, you know, just out of school, maintaining your, your relationships and networks with your professors, your, your colleagues from school, classmates, because, and as you go on in your career, you know, keeping those contacts fresh, because you just don't know when those contacts will come in handy for you. This world always throws us a curve when you least expect it. I mean, who would have ever envisioned, I've been doing this a long time, I mean, none of us have ever lived through what we're going through now. So, you know, life throws you curves. And I think the stronger your network is, uh, the better suited you might be to finding new opportunities if they come up. Um, I would not have been here had I not had my network with my professors when I was at Western. And it's just the way that it worked. And, I look at uh, other opportunities have come my way. And I, 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 tell, I told my students, think about when opportunities present themselves, they may be opportunities you might think you're not quite ready for. And you gotta push yourself out of your comfort zone. And you know, I had to push myself out of the, my comfort zone many times. And Somebody thought you were good enough to recommend you for a 
position or they wouldn't have made that recommendation. And even though you may not think you're ready for it, uh, find a way to dig down deep and provide value back and, and make that opportunity come together. And, and I shared with them uh, back in 2003, I was asked to be on the board of directors uh, for a company called Spartan Stores up in Grand Rapids. They're a $9 billion company. And, you know, I walked in and it was a lot of because of my networking. But I was asked to be on this board and I, I'm in a boardroom with all these multimillionaire CEOs of major corporations across the United States. And I'm a college professor. It was, it was very intimidating. And I had to find a way I could either just shuck it and say, I'm not up to this, or I got to find a way to, to find a way to bring value to being on that board. And here I am 17 years later, I'm still on that board. And, you know, so I think opportunities sometimes come up where you don't always expect them and you got to be open to it and pursue those opportunities when they're in front of you. And I wanna reemphasize to my alumni, uh, we, we have, you know, my predecessor, Bill Haynes, back 50 some years ago, coined the phrase, there's a future in food. And I, I think that term is as relevant today as it was 50 years ago. And we've, all, we've always talked, you know, when the economy goes down, I don't have to buy a car. I can hold on to that old computer I got, even though I would like the newer technology. I might not make a house purchase, but I gotta eat. And you know, this pandemic has really drove that point home in a big way. I mean, where food was considered an essential industry. And treat those frontline people with care because I was crushed early on in the pandemic. I gotta be honest with you, I'm getting off a little bit here, but you know, I had a young lady, I was doing curbside. You know, we we're all, you know, everybody was paranoid to go into a store. Nobody early on, it was like, do I venture out? You know, do I do this? And I had this young lady, you know, and I was helping her unload my curbside order into my car and she looked at me and she said, Thank you for not making me feel like a leper. And I just, I, I had tears in my eyes. I said, thank you for what you're doing for us and our community. I said, you're putting yourself and your health on the line every single day for us so that we can have food on our table. But I was crushed by, you know, how people were treating her at that time. And, and we see a lot of that going on right now with the mask and everything and people are not wanting to wear the mask and I, I think we got to learn to treat people better than what we are but uh, I you know I always say remember your humble beginnings you know when you're you know if you can remember how it was when you were starting your career how difficult that was and and don't forget that as you progress in the organization and move up the ladder, remember what it was like to be like that because that's gonna serve you so well. Your people are gonna respect you that you don't treat them like, oh, you're just a clerk in the store. You were a clerk once too. Do you remember what it was like? You know, so I think it's important regardless where you're at in your career is that you remember what it was like when you started out and the people that helped you in your career and, and can you help others uh, along the way to build their careers and they'll be forever grateful to you for that i could keep going on but i think <laughs> give a professor an hour and it's like Woo, it's gone <laughs> I know there's a lot more i would ask you so i i thank you for joining us today and i think just talking with you the past couple of days, it's pretty obvious why your name was mentioned so much. So I'm excited you were, you were able to join us today. And I hope that when I beg you to come back and do something else, you'll be willing, even if you're in the middle of your tropical uh, retirement zone. So 
<laughs> I do hope you're able to get out and enjoy some of that pretty soon. I think my alumni are so confused about if I'm retired or if I'm not retired. <laughs> Last year, we had the farewell tour uh, on the industry tour, and um, my plans were to be out there again this year with the new guy, and then the pandemic hit, and so we didn't do our annual industry tour of the Midwest. And uh, so that got everybody thinking that I'm, I'm done, but I'm actually on board. Uh, I'm not in the classroom anymore. I, I did retire from the classroom in the fall, but uh, I, I had agreed to stay on until December of 21 so that uh, we could have a real smooth transition. And when the pandemic hit, I didn't know whether that transition plan was gonna maintain itself. Uh, but thankfully, I've offered up my resignation many times during the pandemic because I, I, I firmly believe that I, I would hate to see a young, vibrant, new faculty member lose their job when I know I've got one foot going in the other direction. So, uh, but so far, the university won't let me go. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I'm committed to making this a really smooth transition with Dr. Zwenka and uh, the rest of the food team. I can tell you, I am just thrilled with where our food team is. We've got the best team we've ever had in all the years I've been at the university. I think we've got the, the very best team right now. And uh, so I think the future of the food program is uh, in good hands and will continue to be in good hands. Hey, Frank, I have a kind of a comment uh, to follow up. This is Victor. Victor. Long time. How are you? Yeah. Um, I want to add on to some of the graduates that uh, were out there. Um, first, let me ask you first question. Do you have a nickname that your students give you? Just like as Richard Nussage, we had him as chief. Well, Victor, with the last name of Gambino, I've been called the godfather for a long yeah, time. Yeah, you used to get upset when we used to call you the uh, association from the New York family. But you yeah. could take a joke. <laughs> the Godfather is stuck pretty good. So, all right. Uh, I just want to add on to your to the alumni that just recently graduated. Um, this is a great start to networking. Um, as Chief or Richard Nessage once mentioned, that actually stuck into my brain. Probably one of the only things, but um, was. We were uh, recruiting, I believe we went to some high school in Kalamazoo, trying to recruit kids to join the program. And I remember he, I was standing next to him and uh, some kid asked a question. I don't recall the question, but I remember his response was, he pulled out this little piece of, a piece of paper and said, he wrote down Western Michigan and, you know, diploma. And uh, he crumple it all up and his words were this is just a piece of paper that the university gets you but the most biggest asset you're going to get is networking all these students for the future because you never know when you're going to need them in the future uh so that's always been stuck and impaled in my brain so it isn't what you know but who you know Good to see you again. Well, on that note, I will. Uh, I know Dr. Gambino again was said he was willing to stick around if anyone wants to stay to just chat. You are certainly welcome to do that. I will stop recording in just a second, um, but I want to thank everyone for coming um, and catching up and that kind of thing. If you ever have questions for us, you're welcome to email me back or call me or catch up on LinkedIn if that's easier for you. Um, but I appreciate you being here. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. So I will go ahead and stop recording now. Um, and you all feel free to leave if you need to leave, but also stick around and chat if you would like to do that as well. And go Broncos. Go Broncos. <laughs> I want to hear where a few of you are.